Good morning, Shade Grove Baptist Church. Uh, I am with you this morning, uh, leading us, hopefully, in Sunday School lesson today. Uh, we are looking at the subject of eternal life, and the point is that we can live forever in the presence of God, and that's what we uh, need to know at this time and, and all that's going on around us. We need to know at any time, but especially now, we really need to know. Uh, in the modern society we live in, most people tend to avoid the topic of death. Uh, don't want to talk about it. Don't want to be around cemeteries. Don't want to be, want to be around anything that's going to uh, uh, bring up bad thoughts of our mortality. But the truth is, uh, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to uh, die to get there. Well, we know that's uh, not the way it works. Um, as we go into our study this morning, we are... Uh, and uh, focusing on something that comes in the last uh, chapter of the book of Isaiah, God promised to create new heavens and a new earth that would endure forever. That's from uh, chapter 66, verse 22. In the final two chapters of the book of Revelation, is where we are today, John began uh, describing the fulfillment of that promise and focused on God's undisputed sovereignty. He reported uh, the descent of the new Jerusalem adorned as a bride for her husband, and a new order in which pain and sorrow will no longer exist. And that's what we're focusing on today. And generally, uh, if I had folks in front of me uh, that could talk back to me besides Rhonda, uh, I would uh, be asking you a question, but I'm going to ask it anyway to think about for just a moment uh, as we get into our lesson. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Uh, I can think of lots of places I'd like to live. I'd like to to live sometimes at the coast but I don't want to be there forever and there's times I'd like to be in the mountains but I don't want to be there forever either people have uh, lots of reasons for choosing lots of different places they live many people say they don't choose where they live but the place chooses them for example many people live because live where they live because they choose to be near family or it's because it's near where their jobs are regardless we all have our ideas of what makes a place ideal yet no matter how idyllic idyllic it is no place is perfect problems still arise and of course they're seeing everywhere around us unfortunately uh, that we that will always or not always be the case however and God has promised his followers a perfect home with him that will last for eternity the Apostle John gave us a brief glimpse uh, into eternal life, and that awaits those who follow Christ. So our point that we need to focus on today as we study God's Word is that we can live forever in the presence of God. Uh, I will be reading from the Christian Standard Bible, and we're uh, beginning on uh, in Revelation 21, first five verses. So if you uh, have your Bibles... I'll give you some time to turn to Revelation 21, verse 1 through 5, or your cell phone or whatever you want to follow me on. And it says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Now please remember that point about the sea being no more. We'll talk more about that. I also saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down and out of heaven from God, prepared like a bride adorned for her husband. Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. <clears throat> Look, God's dwelling is with humanity, and he will live with them. They will be with his people, and God himself will be with them. Excuse me, I read that wrong. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Grief, crying, and pain will all be no more. Because the previous things have passed away. And then the one seated on the throne said, Look, I am making everything new. He also said, Write, because these words are faithful and true. As we begin looking at verses 1 and 2, it says, With, uh, with the earthly struggle over and Satan confined to the lake of fire, God will reign as the undisputed sovereign. But what about the state of the faithful followers of Jesus Christ? Every believer since that time has wanted that question answered authoritatively. Everybody wants to know, what's going to happen to Christians? Well, 
Let's find out what John has to offer us. He offered a wide-angle view of a new heaven and a new earth while focusing on the holy city and the new Jerusalem. God created the heavens and the earth in Genesis 1.1 and declared his creation to be very good in verse 31. However, when Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, sin's evil influence penetrated into God's perfect creation and transformed the earth into a place of rebellion. Only Christ's redemptive work on the cross could reverse what sin had ruined. The first earth had passed away, and in order to make room for the new one. Now, interpreting this next part, pray about it. Uh, I agree with what the author of our lesson says, but uh, you might need to pray on it. Paul spoke to the whole creation, groaning in travail while waiting to be freed from decay. That's Romans 8, 19 through 12, uh, 22. With nothing with which to compare a new heaven and earth other than the present heaven and earth, some conclude that John intended a replacement of heaven and earth. Now, there's a television show I love to watch, and it's called American Restorations. And in this television show, people come in, and they bring in some really odd items sometimes. Now, sometimes it may be something as simple as a child's tricycle. It may be a Coke machine. Uh, it may be uh, a car even sometimes, but all kinds of antiques. And it's something from their childhood usually or it's something a grandparent left them and it's beat up and it's worn and it's aged and quite frankly it probably looks like it's ready for the junk pile but it has sentimental value to them and they'll bring them in and the fellow will look at them and they say, how do you want it? And most folks will say, well, I want it like it came off the factory floor the day it was made. And of course, you know, they do some dickering back and forth. They talk about the price. But in the end, most folks are going to say, that's the way I want it. A few people will say, mm, just fix it so it's workable. But most of them want it like brand new. And I'm always amazed at what the guys do because they tear it down to all the little parts and they make it back. If parts are missing, they find those parts. If parts are broken, they repair those parts. And then when the person comes by to pick it up, they reveal it, pull the cover off of it, and uh, quite frankly, it always looks like it would have looked the day it was made. And sometimes we're talking 50, 75, or who knows, maybe even 100 years ago. So that's what we're looking at. We're not looking at the fact that from what my author is saying and what uh, John is telling us, when we talk about a new heaven and a new earth, we're not talking about uh, a heaven that's going to replace or an earth that's going to replace. It's going to be remade. It's going to be restored. It's going to be made new. Um, John intended uh, a replacement of heaven and earth. However, new meant new in quality rather than something that has never previously existed. So it's going to be re remade. Um, and pray about it. Think about it. I'm sure we'll talk about this when we see each other sometime. The puzzling clause, and I mentioned this earlier, the sea was no more, actually amplified the newness and quality of heaven and earth. The sea represented the source from which the beast arose to bring chaos and destruction. If you read uh, Revelation 13, 1, it speaks of the beast, and I think it had seven heads and ten crowns. And But the one thing that I got most from reading the verses is it spoke blasphemy. It spoke blasphemy of God. And so it is the beast. So as long as the sea existed, the potential for uh, the uh, reversion of creation to chaos would exist. Therefore, the phrase meant that when God established a new heaven and a new earth, there will no longer be a source for chaos. So no ocean. Uh, if you were planning on doing your ocean fishing, uh, we'll have to figure out something else there, but no ocean. John compared the new Jerusalem to a bride adorned for her husband. Uh, quite frankly, uh, I'll always remember uh, the day that, uh, that, that Ron and I were married. Uh, beautiful bride. Uh, if you've never seen, come by the house sometime while I'll show you the picture. But uh, it, it was a special day, and a special day to see her in a wedding gown. And for those of you that have, I'm sure you would say the same thing. He adorned her for the presentation before the Father in the new heaven, in the new earth. With this metaphor, he explained the redemptive work of Christ. And since all of history has moved 
to this great point of the marriage between the lamb and his bride. In verse 3, uh, the introductory phrase, Then I heard a loud voice from the throne. And that's significant because you're hearing the voice of God and his throne is right here with us in the new Jerusalem. Anchored the forthcoming announcement to a basic theme that ran throughout the Old Testament that God's dwelling will be with his people. Uh, this referred to the tabernacle, uh, a place only the priest could enter. Now God will, tabernacle being a verb, pitch his tent with his people and will permanently live with them. They will be my peoples, a people distinct from all the other people of the world whom he will judge according to their works. Therefore, John set forth the new heaven and the new earth as the dwelling of God's people with the Lord God in their midst. So, uh, He's going to be right here with us, folks, and it's going to be an awesome thing. Verse 4, nothing that grieves or pains the mind can exist in the fullness of God fullness of God dwelling among his people. Therefore, he will wipe away every tear from their eye. His original audience would have found encouragement in John's description, knowing death will be no more. No longer would they mourn over loss or cry in anguish or pain in a, in a persecution. The previous things will no longer exist because God's presence will comfort them and remove the sorrows of sin and pa from sin's past and guarantee they will never again experience what results from sin. Verse 5, not only will God make his dwelling with humanity, he will make everything new. And of course, I've already been speaking of that. Nothing lies outside the effects of the consummation of Christ's redemptive work. Uh, you know, we are made a new creature, a, a new creation whenever we trust in Christ, when we uh, we cast off our old self and we have, we're new. Uh, same thing here, the present tense. I am making uh, is known as a, pro, a prophetic present and carries readers into the time when God indeed makes all things new. Uh, John reached a crescendo as he described the one seated on the throne. God has the power to make everything new. He will remove, remove every sinful impurity and retain everything that is holy and good. If John's readers found this too good to be true, the Holy Spirit nudged him with these words, and I like what he said right here. He's encouraging John. Now, John, you've just seen this. I've shown you all of this. You've had a bird's eye view. Write it down. Write because these words are faithful and true, but write it down. Uh, the discussion has come up many times about uh, the language in Revelation. Uh, Paul wrote what he saw. There's a lot of uh, discussion, and I think there's there, there's a lot of agreement that if if no, I may have said Paul, excuse me, John, if John saw today or was living today with today's vocabulary, how would he describe it? He used the cap vocabulary he knew. Uh, you know, there's lots of things we can compare to the day that he didn't have to compare to then. But anyway, God asserted his faithfulness and he will do everything he has promised to do. God will keep his word and John provided a written record of God's promise so that people would know God is faithful. Um, just a few things to bring out from what we've covered in verses 1 through 5. In verse 4, I must emphasize four things. There will be no death. Our new home in heaven will be a place of total victory. John wrote previously that death would be thrown into the lake of fire. There will be no grief, no sin, no regret, or loss will remain to cause us to grieve or mourn. There will be no crying since grief will exist no longer. We will have no more cause for crying. No pain since the sin that led to the fall will have been removed completely. All pain will be gone. Great, wonderful things to be thinking about. Moving on to verse 6, continuing in, in chapter 21, verses 6, 7, and 8. Then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will freely give to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. Now, I want to stop and stress the point there. I will give freely to the thirsty. Keep that uh, thought in mind. We will discuss that. 
to the thirsty from the spring of the water of life. The one who conquers will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowards, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their share will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. <clears throat> Excuse me. Verse 6. One word in Greek translated, it is done underscores the climactic nature of the fulfillment of the prophecies woven throughout verses 1 through 5. God sometimes announces that something is done before it happens. Therefore, the prophetic view, John saw the future as present and heard the declaration directly from God that every detail planned long ago and every prophetic promise concerning the consumption of redemption is, excuse me, the consummation of redemption is done. What Paul saw was real. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. It was real. It was real. He was seeing it as it happened. Uh, it wasn't on a movie screen. It wasn't in a dream. Uh, it was being shown to him. And it was present. Even though it hadn't happened yet, he said, it is done. The Lord declared the reason for announcing that he has made all things new before it happened by repeating his name in chapter 1. He says, I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Every detail of the cosmos rested in his power. From beginning to end, God is the sovereign God, the sovereign ruler of the universe. He created and upholds his power. As Stephen has said over and over, uh, the coronavirus is not new to God. God not only knew the coronavirus three months ago, God not only knew the coronavirus was coming a year ago, God knew the coronavirus was coming when he created this earth because he is all-knowing. John beautifully pictured salvation with the image of drinking from the spring of the water of life. He drew from the imagery of Isaiah 55, 1, Come, everyone who is thirsty, come to the water and confirmed the promise in Revelation 7:17 7, the lamb who was at the center of the throne 